So over the, over the last few weeks, months, we've been doing uh, men and women in harmony in the Bible. And uh, I thought I'd do something similar. Uh, though actually my text today, my example is probably more about men and women in disharmony. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. And uh, you know their interactions, uh, their dynamics, and also really how God fits into that whole picture. So we're going to start with uh, Genesis 20. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start with the central text, and I'm going to move outwards. So we're going to get some more context and back into sort of history and consequences. And it's going to be like a little onion I'm going to build today. So uh, hopefully it's not going to be too complicated. Uh, we're going to stay mainly in Genesis. Uh, so if you're going to get your Bibles out, this, that's, what we, that's what we're going to be flitting sort of between sort of Genesis 15 and Genesis 22. That's what we're going to be mainly, but we're going to start in Genesis 20. Uh, is, do we have anybody to read the first, chapter, the first scripture today? No, that's fine. I will read it myself. That's cool. Um, there we are. So let's start with Genesis 20, verses 1, 2. Let's see how quick it works. There we are. 1, 2, 10. And I know you can't read that, so I'll read it for you. Now Abraham moved on from there into the region of Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. For a while, he stayed in Gerar, where Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. Then Abilamech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. But God came to Abilamech in a dream one night and said to him, you are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Now, Abimelech had not gone near her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say, he is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then God said to him in a dream, yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience, so I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why I did not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all yours will die. Early the next morning, Abilamech summoned all his officials, and when he told them all that happened, they were very much afraid. Then Abilamech called Abraham in and said, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such great guilt upon me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should not have been done. And Abilamech asked Abraham, What was your reason for doing this? That's a really good question. What was the reason? So, I mean, let's take a little dive into this. This is kind of a crazy situation, right? You know, Abraham is saying of his wife, he's my sister, she's my sister. This guy, this king comes along, takes her off for his own, and then kind of God steps in. That's, that's a bit mad, really. Um, so I just, I just want to give you a bit of context about what, what, why I chose this verse. So uh, a couple of, well, about a month ago, I decided that my Bible study really wasn't really good at all, and I thought, I, you know, I thought I'd let me just do something to kickstart it back into gear, and I found a, a three-month, read the Bible in a three-month Bible plan. Um, do I recommend that? No. <laughs> it's, it was really stupid, uh, but actually, uh, you know, I'm reading sort of 15, 10, 15 chapters a day, a bit of the Old Testament, a bit of the New Testament. Uh, it's a lot to take in, and it's definitely, definitely not something which is kind of there for nuance, but what you, when you're going through at that speed, you kind of get this overview about what's going on. And it's been really interesting doing that reading whilst we've been doing the sort of men and women in the Bible. Uh, because I think when we first started, I was going through all, all Genesis. And I looked at, I looked at this, the Genesis account of men and women. And the men especially, I thought, there's not a one of them who isn't an idiot. <laughs> you go through every example, you think, these, these guys are just not bright. They're not clever, they're, they're weak, they're being manipulated, they're, they're cowardly, they make mistakes, they're, you know, they're, they're just not good examples, but yet they're in the Bible. You know, and I think you know, we sometimes we look at the Bible and we don't understand the Bible is, you know, it says all, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, right? This, the, the, the reason these examples are useful is because they are in some ways bad examples for us to learn from, <laughs> you know. And we ourselves, we are not perfect. So actually, it's great for us to be able to relate to people and see what's going on. So I think that's the context, the bigger context of why I wanted to go into this, into this subject here. So let's take, let's take a look and see what's possibly going on here, right? So what does this show of Abraham's character? I think it shows possibly, I mean, I'm open to suggestion as well, but for me, possibly it shows that he wants to avoid conflict. Uh, he, he, he's afraid. He's fearful. Um, he's... 
he's anxious. You know, um, he lies. He lies about this. This is, this is a deceit that he's done. Um, so there's lots of negative things here as well. And Sarah goes along with it. Why does she go along with it? Why does she allow herself to be put in a position of danger? You know, to be taken by somebody else. Um, to be separated from her family, from her, from her husband, from, from the unit, you know, taken to a different, taken to a different, you know, a different home, you know, to be, you know, without the protection of her husband. She allowed, she kind of steps into that, and probably she didn't have a choice. Perhaps that was the way it was. She was forced to do that, but she still did it. She was, she followed her husband's instructions to do that. What does this tell us about their relationship together? You know, the fact that Abraham thought it was more important that, his, that he was safe than his wife was protected was, you know, quite a, quite a bad thing, right? And actually, we are talking about two kind of pillars of the faith that we talk about, Abraham and Sarah, but who comes out best in this, in this account? The person that comes out best is Abimelech. You know, he, he is the most godly person in this whole account. The king who took, you know, he, he, was, he has an interaction with God, he prays, he's, you know, he's, and he quite rightly chides Abraham, like, what have you done? What have you done? So this is the kind of core I want to talk about here. And I think, you know, going forward, and let's, let's see what Abraham, see how Abraham defends himself. So in verse 11, Abraham replied, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place, which clearly wasn't true, because Abimelech had prayed to God and was responding to him. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, through my daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So, you know, he's wheedling out. He's trying to renegotiate what the truth is here. You know, he's kind of, he's, you know, he's being weak here. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere you go, save me. He is my brother. I mean, this is interesting, right? Abraham says to, says, basically blackmails his wife and says, if you love me, you'll say this. You'll say this situation. And this is in response to God's telling him to go out and, you know, actually, this is in direct response to God's command to him to go out and leave his, uh, leave his father's land. Then Abilamech brought sheep and cattle and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham, and he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abilamech said, my land is before you, live wherever you like. To Sarah, he said, I am giving you a brother a thousand shekels of silver. And it's quite funny. Did you see how he mentions, see how he talks about Abraham, says your brother, a little dig. Like, you know, I know you're a wife, but, you know, you told me you're a brother, let's, let's say that again. So he had a little dig back in there, I quite like that. He says, I am giving you a brother, a thousand shekels of silver. This is to cover the offense against you, before all who are with you. You are completely vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abilamech, his wife, and his slave girls, so they could have children again, for the Lord had closed up every womb in the village household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. This is a crazy situation. There's a lot going on here. This is quite complicated. This is quite, you know, this is quite, you know, ooh, what can we learn from here? <clears throat> so let's go back. Let's go back and see, you know, what, what kind of excuses could Abraham have about this behavior? I mean, it's interesting. If we go back to Genesis 12, from 14 to 20, so let me scroll back. Okay, that's probably a better way of doing this. Give me a second. Go to Genesis 12. And then 14, I'll read that for you. Okay, Genesis 12, 14, 20. When Abraham, when Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very good woman, talking about Sarah here, and when the Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and he was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for his sake, and Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, maidservants and maidservants for camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? This is a crime with antecedents. You know, this has happened before. Abraham's got four. <laughs> you know. And you know what? It worked out for him before. He got cattle, he got maidens, he got worldly goods. It worked out quite well for him. So maybe perhaps there's something else that's happening. When sometimes we have a plan that isn't godly, it can work out for us. We can get good things. It can happen to us. And that we can think, okay, did it once, got away with it. This is obviously working for me. Let's do it again. Perhaps that's what's going on. I'm not sure. Um, and then, but let's, let's take another look at what, what, um, you know, what, what's happening in Abraham's life. So let's scoot forward a little bit. 
So immediately before Genesis 20, the account with Abimelech, it's the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. And immediately before that is perhaps one of the most famous man with God interactions in the Bible. It's where Moses negotiates for his family. You know, he says, if there's 10 people, if there's 40 people left, if there's 30 people left, if there's 20 people, if there's 10 people left. It's, and it's an incredible scene of man interacting with God directly and God listening to man. I mean, you know, Abraham should be riding high in this situation. He has an intense relationship with God. He has negotiated with God and come out the top. He, I mean, it doesn't work out for Solomon because there aren't that many things, but he has saved his, he saved his nephew Lot. He should be close to God. He should be confident in God. He's seen God's power. Sodom has been destroyed by the power of God. He knows the power of God. He shouldn't have a reason to lie. He shouldn't have a reason to be afraid. He shouldn't be, have a reason to be you know, unconfident of his place with God. But yet he still does. And again, the Bible is great with this. It doesn't give us examples of heroic people who always do the right things. It shows us people who do the wrong things, and yet God still acts in those situations. And even in, before that, he's been honorable. He's, he's possible. There are character parts of, of, of Abraham which we can absolutely learn from. But again, it doesn't mean that if somebody, if we're good in one area, that we're good in every area, right? We're not perfect as people. And I think this is the great thing that the Bible teaches us. You know, we can be really outstanding. We can be really encouraging and great examples in some areas, but in other areas of our lives, we can be very weak. You know, we can have things which come back at us and things which kind of keep on going at us. But that doesn't mean God abandons us. That doesn't mean that we're alone in the world for that. So, that's so what happens after this. So let's go to, let's see what happens with God. Does God say, okay, Abraham, you're on your own. You've, you've, you've made your own bed. You lie on it. You know, I'm going to now hang out with Bill and because, you know, you, you're obviously not to be trusted. Um, no, let's have a look at uh, Genesis 21. So let's go to Genesis 21. And just in the first couple of verses, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, and as he said, the Lord did to Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Now, you could say this is more a, this is more a, uh, a blessing of Sarah than of Abraham, and we will get into that. We'll get into that next. But actually, it's also a blessing to Abraham. You know, God has fulfilled his promise, fulfilled his covenant. He's given what he's promised to, to Abraham. And this is a great example of the fact that God's promises don't fail regardless of whether we feel like we deserve them or not, right? This is, yeah, this week we've seen the chaos immediately before this, and yet God still carries through his promises, promised them, and, and delivers. And if we uh, go to uh, verse 6, which we'll be looking at in a second, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in this old age. So, So, so there we are. God fulfills his promise. So the next little session I want to go is I want to go a little bit, a little bit bigger. I'm not just talking about Abraham specifically, but Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. We're going to look at a little bit more chaos in this family. So let's, uh, you know, so let's go back into Genesis. Let's go back a little bit into Genesis 17. You keeping up? Okay, okay, let's, uh, in fact, let's go back even further, back to Genesis 15, sorry. Uh, okay, let's give a little bit of context here. Genesis 15. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6, and this is where God sets out his initial promise to Abraham, and it reads from verse 1, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, so Abram. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body 
would be your heir. Took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham's been told, yep, you're going to have children. They're going to be your offspring. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a nation. It's going to be, they're going to be countless. And it says Abraham believed it. Um, so let's take a look. Let's, let's see what happens next. So let's go to Abraham. Let's go to 16. So Abraham's had this promise. And what's happening? He's, you know, a chapter later, he still hasn't had any kids. And suddenly there's a plan which happens. Hagar and Ishmael. In Genesis 16, verse 1, it reads, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. And she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan, 10 years, Sarah's wife took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. So, what's going on here? Why has Sarah got her own plan, right? Sarah comes up with a plan. Um, I'm sure none of us have ever come up with silly plans, right? Um, I came up with a silly plan yesterday myself. Um, we, we've been doing a bit of housework. It's sunny, we've got the weather, and um, we bought a, uh, a rotary clothesline to put in the garden. And, uh, yeah, my wife's, my wife's smiling at me because she knows it's coming. <laughs> so, and I was feeling, you know, when you feel like, okay, the, the day was going well. I was preparing the sermon. I was feeling less anxious. I was earlier in the week. I thought, okay, things are okay. I can take some time out, do some housework. And uh, we have, we've got already like a little, little hole in our garden for a clothesline. So I went out. I thought, yeah, it'll be easy. Plug it in there. Put it in. It was way too big. No problems. It came with its own spike, which you had to hammer into the ground. I thought, okay. Okay, that's fine. I'll go and hammer this spike into the ground. And my wife said to me, she said, read the instructions. <laughs> you know what's coming, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I, I did read the instructions, but then I had my own plan. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I started hammering this, this kind of, this, 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 you know, this thing in the ground. Um, the trouble with our garden is on a slope, right? And I couldn't get this thing to, to go the right angle. So I got it about halfway, put the thing in. It was leaning like we were on a sinking ship. It was pretty awful. So I thought, I thought well, this is too short for me to get an understanding of how it, you know, how it, I need to be able to see to put it, you know, I need, I need a longer pole in order to kind of get it straight, get that visual right on it. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll get the bottom half of the washing line, put it in, use that, hammer it in. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, did, I went away and hammered it, hammered it, hammered it down. I thought, this looks good. Let me just take it out. And so let me take out the, the, the pole. And of course, I couldn't because I hammered it right, right in. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, the next hour was me trying not to swear, um, feeling very embarrassed, um, you know, trying to use you know, hot, hot taps, stoves, washing up liquid, you name it. I tried it. It didn't work. Uh, in the end, we went online, tried to find a, uh, a spare part. There were no spare parts. The manufacturer had a website and said, if you don't have a spare part, you can, you can send us a letter. We'll see what we can do for you. So I wrote, a, I wrote a, um, a letter on the website, and at the end of it, I said, I've been an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, you know, it's, you know, we all come up with our own plans from time to time, so we can't be too hard on Sarah, right? But let's, let's, be, let's be honest, it's not the greatest plan ever in terms of family dynamics, in terms of trust building, in terms of, you know, just, you know, just in terms of communication. There's all sorts of crazy things which are going on here. However, the plan does work. Oh, 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 let's go from this, which is not working. Hang on a second. Oh, thank you, Stefan. There we are. Thank you very much. Forwards, there we are. So, uh, thoughts? Yes. Okay, yeah, and then forwards. Right, okay, thank you. So, what did the plan lead to? And, more importantly, how did God come into this as well? So, 
I think it's conceived. The plan is working. Let's read on. He gets out with Hagar and she conceived from verse 4. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so he, she fled from her. Not a great situation. And again, we can see, Abraham, we've talked a little bit about perhaps his conflict avoidance. You know, I think we can say this is coming in here again, right? It's, again, Abraham doesn't really help the situation. He's just like, you do what you think is best. And perhaps, you know, he is responsible for his own son. He perhaps should have stepped into the door here, right? So, what happens to Hagar? The angel, she fled from her. So Hagar runs away. The, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that was beside the road to Shur. And he said to her, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. I'm running away from mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so they will be too numerous to count. Um, You know, if I'd run away uh, from an abusive situation, I'm not entirely sure that I'd be too encouraged to be told to go back. But that's what happens. Lord wants to put this family back together. Uh, you, you know, and she's sent back and she does go back. But this isn't just a pure submission instruction. The Lord tells her, you know, you are going to have countless descendants. You're going to be a nation. This is going to happen. This is going to be and this is interesting because this is the first child of Abraham where that's being made a promise to. This is before anything that happens with Sarah. This is pure, Hagar gets that blessing first. And God is kind. God is kind to her, despite her despising. Again, because Hagar's not great in this situation either. You know, she has despised her mistress. She's despised the family. You know, there's nobody good in this situation. You know, it's, she's not innocent. But yet, God expresses kindness to her and sends her back in a situation, you said, which, which is going to be hard, but he says, you are going to be a mother of a nation as well. So, reconciliation. They're back together. Did things get better after Sarah had her own son? So let's take a look and go into Genesis 21. And uh, reading from verse 8. So this is after Sarah has her own son. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day that Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son who Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your maid servant. Listen to what wherever Sarah tells you, because it's through Isaac the offspring will be reckoned. Well, make the son of the maid servant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. So, again, we can see Abraham is again, you know, weak. He's distressed. You know, but I think God steps in and says, okay, I know you can't handle this. Let's, let me deal with this. Let me give you the comfort you need. Let's give direction here. You know, it's not a great situation. There's repeated patterns. You know, there's conflict in this family, repeated conflict. There's repeated cowardice from Abraham. There's repeated conflict and avoidance. These things repeat, repeated wrongs, repeated mistakes. And yet God keeps on repeating comfort and blessings time after time. You know, he, I think uh, we look at the Old Testament sometimes, I think the, the, we, we look and see God vanquishing nations, meeting out punishment, destroying cities. And we can sometimes miss the comfort and kindness that God exhibits to individuals and families. And I think this is a great, these, these kind of patriarchal stories are great examples of how God interacts with families and individuals and shows his kindness and love and forgiveness and grace. And that's really kind of what I take from this call. Can we go forward? Thank you. So, let's, uh, we've talked about Abraham and Sarah. We've talked about Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar. Let's talk about Sarah and God. And this is kind of where I want to wrap things up. So let's uh, go back to Genesis 
1750. Now, I've not finished with Abraham. He's going to get a little bit more of a telling off here as well. But let's go back to uh, Genesis 1715. Oops. Uh, 17, okay. And this is, this is just after we talked about God's first interaction with Abraham. And we talked about, we've talked, covered this verse a little bit already. So 15, God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarah. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless you. I will bless her so that he will be with the, so she will be the mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. Now, this is very important, right? This is back in Genesis 17. When did Sarah come up with her own plan? It comes, this is, so this is after, yeah. This is after Sarah's had her own plan, right? So she's not being told this is the plan, but this is after. But this is the first time that Abraham is told that your wife will be part of this plan as well. But does Abraham go back and say, Sarah, listen, you're part of the plan. Be encouraged. You're going to be part of it. Let's take a look. This is in Genesis 17. Let's look in Genesis 18, verses 10 to 15. The Lord said, then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, this is a separate visit. This is a separate conversation. This is where Abraham is where God has sent, sent some angels to, to, you know, to converse and you know, talk with Abraham, mainly, mainly about his, his, his situation with his, his nephew, Lot, which is a completely different situation. But um, you know, what's happening is they're saying, by the way, reminder, your wife's going to be the mother of nations as well. Let's carry on reading. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. So you know what? She had to overhear this. She wasn't being told. She hadn't been told by Abraham that you're going to be mother. She had to overhear it. And I think, I think there's definitely some God action here that kind of let her be in that situation, let her overhear. I mean, I don't know why Abraham didn't tell her. That's not great, right? So, so you know, Sarah overhears her. So Sarah's listening to the entrance of the tent, which is behind him. Which is behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out, my master is old. Will I now have this pleasure? And so the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child when I'm too old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. Um, I don't know about you. I don't know of many examples in the Bible where somebody lies to God's face and comes out well from it the other side, right? <laughs> you know, that's not a great response to, the, to God speaking to you, even if it is for your husband. You know, it's kind of like, wow, that's not, oh, Sarah, what are you doing? You know, but, you know, she kind of, she kind of tries to, tries to kind of defend herself, again, probably picking up from Abraham's conflict avoidance, right? There's, there's, there's stuff in that family which is, there are common themes happening here throughout, right? So, you know, I, and again, Abraham hasn't told her. Why hasn't Abraham told her before? Perhaps he feels, you know, like, okay, she's already got a plan in motion. You know, if I say this now, she's going to say, why didn't you tell this to me this before? You know, who knows what's going on here, right? Uh, <laughs> again, you can see, oh, these are crazy situations, these are dynamics, people lying to God, people avoiding conflict, people coming up with their own plans. What happens next? Well, we know. We know what happens next because we talked about it just previously. God still blesses her. And we go, go back to, again, Genesis 21, which we read a bit earlier. And we can see that God blesses her and says, God, and she says, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. So she calls back to her perhaps, you know, unfaithful response and, uh, you know, says, okay, you got me. You know, this has happened. This is, this is what we think. Sometimes this is the end of the story, but no. Is this happy ever after the family? Not likely. Uh, so if we read on, this is, so from verse six, let's read, let's read through from verse six to 21. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, 
Who would have thought, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have brought him a son in my, his old age. The very next verse. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. Remember this? But Sarah saw that his son was Agur, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham, was mocking, and she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman. So immediately afterwards, immediately after being blessed, she, she has the same dynamic in the family. She throws away. She, and, and she actually, the language is very telling here. She refers to Hagar as a slave. Very dismissive. Very dismissive of, you know, of her, uh, basically, her, 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 her father, the, the mother of her, of, her, of her husband's son, right? And then, yeah. And I think it's interesting, we, we've already covered this a little bit, but it's really interesting that God refers to Hagar not as a slave, but he refers to her as a maidservant. So he's very much like, let's not talk about this as a slave, he's a maidservant, that's the place. You know, so God's very respectful of Hagar's actual position. So, yeah. So it's not happily ever after. It's messy. So what's my point? Because <laughs> yeah, I think, can we just go the next slide? Thank you. So these people, Abraham and Sarah, are heroes of the faith. They are. They are heroes of the faith. You know, we, I mean, if we go into, uh, if we go into Hebrews 11, you can go forward. They are mentioned in Hebrews 11, 11, 16, both of them, Sarah as well as Abraham. They are, mentioned, they are given as perpetual examples of faith and, you know, being close with God. And yet we see in the examples we've just gone through, they are very far from perfect. I think for us, right, we can sometimes feel we have to achieve a level of perfection, a level of righteousness that every, in everything in our lives to be blessed by God, to be recognized by God. I think... This example we've gone through here is a really great example. Now, they did, you know, everything was not perfect. And they went, it wasn't like they had a sudden, you know, they were, they were bad and they were good. No, they were good, they were bad, they were good, they were bad. You know, just, it was incon they, were, they were inconsistent. But yet they shared, they always listened to God. And they did allow God to be blessed. And God always followed through. God always blessed them. He would always fulfill his promises. God's promises are not conditional on our behavior. God will always fulfill his promises. I think the other thing I love about this is it shows the Bible does not whitewash characters in the Bible. I think it's interesting, a lot of early accounts, a lot of early literature of this same time time period, which is 4,000 years ago, you know, a lot of it is about amazing people doing amazing things who never did anything wrong. The fact that the Bible gives us a very detailed character study of these people kind of, for me, helps me to be confident in the authority of the Bible and the reality. You know, it's not, you know, it's not like, okay, let's, let's kind of sweep the unpleasant stuff under the carpet. And that's why the Bible for me is a great resource to go back to recently and say, okay, the Bible is more complicated than I think, but it's more useful than I think as well. It's not just about big monolithic yes, no answers. It's about, let's look at people's characters, let's see what we can learn, let's see how I can relate to them. <laughs> you know? So that for me is a very encouraging aspect of this whole thing. You know, these are real people leaving real lives, real emotions that I can relate to. And God still interacts with those people in a very faithful way, despite their weaknesses. So, and also it's interesting to see these things, how our characters can influence other people around us as well. I think, we, I think it's very clear how Abraham's character weaknesses kind of influence everything around him. I think so, for me, that's always the thing, okay, how can I change myself, I can be aware of my own weaknesses and welcome those things as well. So all these things for me came out today. So I hope you, in the, you found this useful as well, yeah. food for thought, um, and I hope it inspires you to read some more. Again, you know, sort of nobody comes out well, but everybody comes out well in this story. <laughs> and, and in the end, God is faithful. I think going forward from Hebrews 11, I want to read, I want to read the, full, the full thing here. So let me just get to that. Okay, Hebrews 11, Hebrews, oops, 11, let's go there. So Hebrews 11 is the whole kind of talking about all the examples of faith through the Bible. So let's, uh, let's read this little bit we, we have on the screen now from 11 to 16. By faith, 
Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was unable to become a father, because he considered him faithful to him who had made his promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. I just want to segue a little bit into the bigger picture here from the Hebrew writer, uh, back, in, back at 11.39, as we prepare our hearts for the communion. And he sums up all these people. And he says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And that's really interesting, right? These people of faith who are, in, who are flawed, who are damaged, same as us. We are all together with God. You know, we are, through God and through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, able to have that eternal life, able to have that promise of heaven where we were all be together and, you know, in, in that one place, receiving that blessing of heaven, that eternal life. And it's, we're all part of the same tapestry. Yeah. And for that, uh, we're all grateful. So let's... Uh,